what I want to speak on, which is related to the entire series that we did take a break from because of many things, not the least of which is Easter and Palm Sunday. But Clayton had been starting a series, and he's coming back to it. It's about Colossians. And I wish there was actually the other slide that they used for some of the media. It said Colossians, and it was said Jesus over everything, which I, I wish I could have grabbed that graphic because that's partly what I want to talk about, which is Jesus over everything, which is Jesus Christ the head. And so as a reintroduction to Colossians, I'm going to read something that was in my Bible as an introduction to Colossians, and it'll come up. And it says, Ephesians focuses on the body. Colossians focuses on the head. Paul's purpose is to show that Christ is preeminent, first and foremost in everything, and the Christian's life should reflect that priority. Because believers are rooted in him, alive in him, hidden in him, and complete in him. It is utterly inconsistent for them to live life without him. That's just in as an intro in my Bible, which is not a study Bible. And I can easily imagine, by the way, that what was just said there in print is actually kind of edgy. Like, ooh, I, like, I don't know if that makes me feel more comfortable. But it's, there's an element of edginess to it. And if you feel that it was a little edgy, great, because then I'm really excited about what we're going to talk about. So. The notion of Christ as the head is such a bedrock notion, such a bedrock. And to illustrate that, in Acts 2, which is the first in the New Covenant, the onset of the New Covenant, and the first sermon ever preached, which is Peter, right? He said, this is what was recorded. It says, this is what he said, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, a lot of opportunity for offense there, God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of their apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Now, the word Lord means probably what you think it means, and, but it also means this, which is probably more revealing about the concept. The word Lord means master, owner what it means. It's some, somehow, I think in churchianity, it's easier to say Lord and not get that other aspect like my owner, my master. That's what it means. And I found it very interesting that in the very first altar call, you could say, that this concept, if you were to shorten, like literally what was happening to the, the minds of those in the audience listening to this first sermon, they were introduced to Jesus as both Lord and Christ, they were cut to the heart, and now they realized and were open to instruction. That's, like, in very short order, that's what occurred in the first sermon. And it's all based upon a very simple idea that Jesus Christ, as Lord, master, owner, there was an openness immediately. They were cut to heart in recognition of that, and now they're, they're open to instruction. It's a very short-form way to think of what happened in the very first sermon, very first altar call. And I submit to you that this very concept of the Lord as master and owner, Christ the head, is the bedrock, a bedrock revelation that can easily be diminished over time. Because if you're like a regular, normal Christian, there's always a quest for new revelation. New revelation as you grow in Christ. It's a natural thing. And there's a, there's a legitimate question to ask yourself. Does our new revelation build upon this foundation? That's it. This is about as bedrock concept as you can have about Jesus Christ as Lord. As my master. As my owner. The head. So... We're going to talk about Christ the head, and this continues back, as I said, in Colossians. And Colossians 1.18 says this, And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. And as you can see in this picture, this is in reference to what Clayton preached in week two of the series. He talked about this very notion. He says he has in his Bible like a drawing of a stick figure man. So I got one. I didn't draw it. 
This is probably beyond my talent level, but I got it from the internet. I thought it was actually quite representative. And I loved it because there is, it's such a simple concept, and to see a stick figure drawing like this and Christ being the head, well, that's really the only feature that's prominent, is it? I mean, everything else is kind of nondescript, really not much animation, and the only thing that you could almost surmise is animated is the head. So I thought it was a great idea. Kudos to Clayton. So the question would be, well, what happens if I lose connection to the head? So if you go to the next slide. So now this is my skill, by the way. I can work with digital images. I can create variations. So all I did was remove the head from the body, which kind of makes it sort of simple and at some level understandable, right? Because sometimes concepts become so fogged over because they're so complicated. Well, this, it is possible for you to be disconnected from the head, and if that were to be true, this is what your life is like. And it doesn't seem very appealing, so I'm not asking you to engage in very theater, theoretical notions of what you think of your theology. And actually, if you could, think of yourself like a child, because that's the best way to receive things of the kingdom. So if I were to show a child this, which I'm hoping to do possibly the next time in the children's church, because I kind of assume I'm going to get some very great answers. So what would it look like, like really, what would your life look like if I cut your head off? Not, that's true. More so than you think, by the way. And if I were to ask that to a child, they would probably say, well, if you cut my head off, I wouldn't know what to do. Because at some intuitive level, they realize that all their thought process and all of the direction they receive is from here. So if I don't have that, then I, I, I don't even know what I would do. Pretty simple idea, right? They would also probably say, well, anything I did do would probably be pretty weird. This way, Clayton mentioned exactly these things, by the way. I'm just following up what he said. And they probably would think, well, you know, because they've heard the saying, you know, running around like a chicken with its head cut off. Yeah, it's a, it's a legit saying. Praise God. So the notion of doing weird things is part and parcel of really not having in any way connection to the head. And most people would naturally understand that. Certainly a child would. And there is a spiritual analogy, of course, of what that really looks like for us. So if you were to lose connection to the head, what that would mean from a spiritual analogy perspective is that I now operate in the flesh, carnal. That's all it is. So if you were operating in the flesh and now carnal, this is what would happen, as Romans 8 says. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. And I didn't have it, which is the, the following verse in verse 6. It talks about being spiritually minded. That's not possible because all the spiritual connection that you have is embodied in the head. So if the head is now disconnected, you're operating only in the flesh with no opportunity to be spiritually minded. And as verse 6 says, when you are spiritually minded, you now have access to life and peace. It's a simple concept, disconnection from the head. So moving on, what does life look like when I am connected to the head, because we don't want to spend too much time on something that is disturbing, to say the least. As it says, my values and my priorities align with his. That's what it looks like. Why is that so? Well, when you are connected to the head, it says in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 16, for who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. And it's actually referencing Isaiah 40, verse 13, which it says, which is from the New Living Translation, who is able to advise the Spirit of the Lord? Who knows enough to give him advice or teach him? See, connection to the head means instruction goes one way. One way. Top down. Not bottom up, top down. 
And in as much as we think we know the best idea of what our life should embody or what we believe ought to be as priorities or values is the same as to say that we are now instructing him, which I appreciate that seems like an absurd concept, but it still is very simple. We receive instruction from the head. And to say it another way, we aren't in charge. If you have a child, that's a cutting edge of what that looks like. Okay. See, Jesus' focus is advancing his kingdom here. That's Jesus' focus. And he invites us to partner with him. Us. As flawed as you think you are, as inefficient, as deficient, however you want to view yourself, he still has chosen his plan is to partner with us. The body connected to the head will reflect his focus. And by the inverse, the body disconnected will depart from his focus. See, the notion of authority is, for, for many people, a difficult concept. And you can spend a lot of time working that out. But here's the truth. You, you as an individual, you have governance authority over your time, your values, and your mission. You. That's a product of your will, and God's giving you free will to do that. So you have governance authority both in your life and for all those that you are responsible for, which is very typical with families. You still get to make that decision. Because God offers you a choice. That's as plain as I can put it. The head is focused on the kingdom and having it manifest here on earth. And the body connected to the head will reflect that focus in increasing measure. And you have a choice because you have governance authority both in your life and in your family's lives. That's as simple as I can put it. So, by governance authority, what that typically looks like is you are now the gate. And you get to decide what comes in and what does not. So an interesting way for you to evaluate how you're doing in this regard, I'm not here to judge you, that's between you and God. Please understand. But what are you saying yes to? That's a very important question that is a very real question because you make choices. And I just said, it is your, you have governance authority to make all of those choices. And just as a, a leader would stand at the gate and decide what comes in and what does not, that is your choice. And you get to decide what you say yes to, as in what comes in. That is your responsibility. See, the reason why I'm emphasizing such a simple concept is this, amongst many reasons. But if you have a warfare model of what it looks like to be a Christian in this world, which I do, a warfare model means that the enemy wants you to be disconnected from the head. That's like the most obvious plan. And why is that? Again, going back to Colossians verse 2, verse 8 in chapter 2, don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies and high-sounding nonsense that comes from human thinking and from the spiritual powers of this world rather than from Christ. So that last phrase, rather than from Christ, puts the issue of connectedness squarely front and center. Because if Christ, if you are now disconnected from the head, whatever your value system and your focus is not from Christ. It's from somewhere else. It's black and white. It's black and white. And the enemy's interest to subvert your life and your family's means that he desires to capture you with, as it says, empty philosophies and high-sounding nonsense. I love the way they phrase that. That's the cutting edge. Right there. It's one or the other. Connected, disconnected. If you're connected, your values and priorities come from Christ.
Christ. The enemy not desiring that wants you disconnected from the head such that what you are getting now as your values and priorities for somewhere other than Christ. I'm not going to keep emphasizing the point because I think that is pretty clear. So the question being now, how do we work this out? Because I'm saying something that hopefully you're not arguing with me inside. I hope so. But that's okay. How do we work this out? Because I've said it so many times, I'm really not interested in theory. I'm interested in like real life, this is the cutting edge, rubber hits the road, like this is your life now. And now we have to take all of these concepts and now ground it in our life somehow. And that's my interest. So how do we work this out? The most natural response that you would have to what I just said in terms of how you actually work this out, in terms of being connected to the head, your natural response probably would be, maybe, maybe not, is to recognize the importance of hearing God's voice. That makes intuitive sense. That God is the head, what he's saying I need to hear, clearly. Can you, and don't hate me for saying this, and don't hear what I'm not saying. Hearing is vital. But there's something more basic and more important than that. And let me explain. So I said, don't hear what I'm not saying, because I'm not trying to have you say, well, Dwayne said hearing God's, not, God's voice is not that important. Oh, it is. It is. But there is something more basic than that. And this is the key. As I said, this is the practical. I'm trying to give you something so simple and so practical for you to work out. And the key is, am I willing to recognize Christ as the head? That doesn't sound so practical yet, but just bear with me. See, Colossians 1 verse 18 says this, And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. And by all, it means there's nothing in which he doesn't have the preeminence. Sorry for the double negatives there. He has total superiority over everything. There's no ambiguity. There's a church, there's your life, there's your family's life. To the degree that you are willing, because it is your choice, he has total superiority. So here's a practical thing that comes out of total superiority. Am I willing to give him the prerogative? Am I? Because you know I love words, so we're going to have a definition. What does prerogative mean? Here we go. Exclusive right, power, or privilege. It isn't shared or conditional. It isn't. Giving someone the prerogative means that I sacrifice all of my own rights in deference. That's what prerogative means. And if I'm saying, Christ, you have the preeminence and total superiority in my life, and I'm now going to give you the prerogative, this is very practically now what that looks like. And now you're probably seeing squirming. Maybe it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. How do I get out of this? Well, you can't. Because all means all. He's, he has the preeminence over everything. Total superiority. And by implication, for me to now say, I give you the prerogative means uh, you have the exclusive right and power, which I'm not saying anything new by revelation, because as I told you, the way the new covenant start, they were said, they were told, this Jesus whom you crucified is both Lord and Christ. He is your master. He is your owner, which naturally in their minds is to say that, oh, uh, yeah, what you say goes. What you say goes. I don't get a choice now. In the full measure of what prerogative means as one who has the preeminence, that's what it looks like. So here's a very practical point that I've learned in my life. Giving him the prerogative will open your ears to hear. See, for me, in Proverbs 2, verses 1 to 4, talks about exactly this concept of, like, we all like the idea of having wisdom. We love this idea, like, I want to be wise. I want to have wisdom and understanding, and we can quote it. We can say, well, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of the wisdom. 
And sorry, none of this is up there. And so I asked the natural question, well, how do I get the fear of the Lord? Well, Proverbs 2, verses 1 through 4 tells you exactly that. It says, if you cry out, and I'm just going to paraphrase it. Basically, what it's saying is, if you are so desperate to know and understand that you don't have it, you don't have what you need, you don't see what you need to see, and if you are so desperate for it, you cry out and say, I need you to tell me. And then it says, if you do that, then you will understand the fear of the Lord. Go read it. And to summarize, all this is saying is that if I recognize in myself, I cannot see what you see. I don't know what you know. I, don't, I can't make a great decision in my life in this juncture unless you help me and I'm crying out to you. I've now given him the prerogative. That's literally as basic as I understand it. Because when you know you don't have it and you have to go to the one who does, you are now saying to yourself, speak whatever you say. I'm desperate to hear your perspective on it. And now your ears are wide open. That's what giving him the prerogative looks like. And sometimes, if I can be very honest, it takes time for you to get to that place. Just being very honest. I have had to face through some major decisions, as we all do. And sometimes my singular prayer is this. God, if you don't help me to see, I can't see. That's my prayer. Help me to see because I can't. This entire question that I'm putting before you in the most practical of ways is this. This is a question of your will. It's a question of your will. Are you willing to give him the prerogative? It's your choice. It is entirely a measure of your choice. And sometimes you have to get to the end of yourself and realize, I can't do this. But it's a question of your will to give him the prerogative and say, speak. I need you to speak. I won't know unless you say. That's when Christ really is the head to you and you are now connected. It is very easy for us to get into very spiritual notions. And in the Garden of Gethsemane, like this question of your will was front and center because Jesus said this in Matthew 26, verse 39, New Living Translation, love it. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Your will, not mine. Jesus is not asking you to do anything that he didn't do himself as the model. In the most pivotal moment of his life, when everything hung, hung, all of our lives hung in the balance in this moment, not my will, but yours. So, I'm going to talk to you, I'm going to share a little bit of my life with you because that's the best example I have. And I'm just going to try and explain a little bit of my journey, because it's just that. It's just a journey. And we all have our own. And some of this was brought to my mind as I was preparing. So I'm like, okay, God, I'll share. So if you can imagine when Marie and I were a lot younger, you can imagine that. We don't feel so young anymore. This is circa now year 2001-ish, so 23 years ago. And we had at that time, our third son was born in, in the year 2000. 
and just as context, because context is super important. That's why I felt to share some of this, just to give you, because you heard some bits and pieces, but I'm now going to give you some of the context. So our third son was born, and both Marie and I came from families with three kids. So in my natural mind, I'm thinking, I mean, we've kind of like hit the mark, haven't we? I mean, like, really? Like, I have no vision of anything beyond this point in time. And so there's this open question of, like, you know, are, are we just done having children? Just, like, parents, you, you encounter this question. What can I say? And, and Marie was open to it, but I kind of wasn't. I literally wasn't. Because in my mind, in my most natural mind of thinking, I'm like, three kids? I mean, I was one of three. Marie's one of three. I mean, like, we're, we've hit, I mean... <laughs> For so many reasons, which I don't want to detail. But the point was this, that, and she prayed. They said, God, I'm open, but if, if you're, if you, if a fourth child is in, in a sense, our future, you have to change me. That's what she was praying to God. What's that? Yeah, change, Dwayne. Yeah, sorry. I'm mixing up. Sorry. <laughs> Pronouns today is like, they messed everything up. Anyway. <laughs> sorry. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I brought really bad thoughts into many people's heads, sorry. <laughs> so one day I was, I was and I, I don't even know if I was actively praying about this question, but I did hear a question put to me. And this question was from God, hey, what about my vision of your family? That's what God said. And it's just a question. But it put everything pretty much front and center of like, I mean, you have your vision of your family, but what about mine? Just, just real life, man. Just real life. And of course, you know that I yielded on that point because our fourth son was born in 2002. And that was, like most things, the beginning of a journey for sure. But, you know, we came to this church in 2003, early 2003, and Ken and Michelle, and I, I told them before, if I don't thank you, I say thank you. They had a profound influence on our lives and still do. And we were, we were taught about the kingdom. Our introduction to this church was the kingdom. That's what we immersed ourselves in. Not mine, his, the king and his kingdom. And you've heard said recently, which is partly the reason why I wanted to give a little bit of context. You heard two encounters night ago, Clayton had me share, because we got to this point about 20 some years ago, that we put our kids on the altar. And some of you may be like, what, what, what was that about? Now I'm gonna tell you what that was about. You see, when we were raising children 20 some years ago, there was a dominant paradigm of thinking in parenting. And it was, went along, generally along this line, is that you know, if you get them into the right schools, preschool, elementary, junior high, high school, and of course college, that if you follow this path and you're intentional about and ensuring that they go down this path, that when they graduate, they'll have a good life. That was, I'm just, for those of you who raised kids in that time, that was a general paradigm of thinking. And we valued education, of course. But it was brought squarely to us, and this is something that we had to decide, that in a similar way, so are you open to my vision for your children in terms of their life? And so for us to put our kids on the altar was to say, that in as much as we understood that, yes, we want them to have a good life. Of course, who doesn't? What parent doesn't? But are you open to what I have for your children? And we had to yield to that point. And so we did, as best as we knew. As best as we knew. Because every parent carries dreams and visions for their children's future. And we had to say, God, not so much about what we think and desire, but now what do you have? So we did that.
and along the way, so we are open. And then along the way, we're just saying yes as best as we knew to what his prerogative was. And that's why I say I, I couch this as a journey. Sorry. So this came to mind. Like as I was preparing for last week. And I have, this is my old Bible. I, I'm, I'm not that studious. Don't think just because it's falling apart. But I had written something in my old Bible. I, I, God reminded me of this, so I went and looked it up. And it was from Psalm 127. And I'm not a big journaler, but I wrote something in my Bible. It's, and this is dated November 7, 2004. And my inscription on it is this, my dream, with an exclamation point. And if you know Psalm 127, it starts by, you know, unless the Lord builds the house, its builders labor in vain. In vain you rise early and stay up late, toiling for food to eat, for he grants sleep to those he loves. And my dream, I circled it, was that I could sleep. Not that I was having problems sleeping. But there would be a time that I could rest. Yeah. But I had something to do. Sorry. And it said in the remainder of Psalm 127, it says this. Sorry, I have to take off my glasses because I can't even see anymore. It says... Because I have four sons, if, if you didn't know. I have four sons. It says, sons are heritage from the Lord. Children, a reward from him. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior are sons born in one's youth. Sorry. Blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. They will not be put to shame when they contend with their enemies in the gate. So, the reason why I knew I couldn't sleep figuratively was that God put a vision in me that I had to train them to contend with the enemies in the gate. To train them to lead, to be, stand up to be counted, and to do damage. And the funny thing, as I look back now, I did that the best that I knew how. Whether I did a good job, I don't know. But I knew that was something that God put in me for the future. And I took the time to explain that because 20 plus years ago, or almost 20 years ago when I wrote this, you know, in, in our area at that time, what, what was this area like? A prophet came through and she described this area as Pleasantville. It's the way she described it. And it was. It was. Everything about it was nice and tidy and peaceful. It's not that now. It isn't. And I'm thankful because it's like God saw that. He saw it. And in a sense, I was preparing my kids for war. And the war was not yet. And God is like that. 
if you have a vision for your life and for your children. There is a future that is not yet. I couldn't see, and maybe you can't either. But if you're open to what the head desires to see fulfilled as part of his focus, then you are now open to the possibilities that he sees for the future that is not yet. And me personally, I can just say that I'm so thankful. Because I couldn't see, but he did. Whether I, I don't know if my job is done, I don't feel like it is. Because that's part of my heart. Yes, there's my kids in the natural, and I'm willing to help anybody to train them up as well. That's just the way I tick. So I said all that because I just wanted to give you just a picture in our journey. Just as real as I can make and explain to you the process and the journey. And like most things in the kingdom, a lot of it just boils down to the little yeses that you make along the way. It's just not a singular event. It just isn't. Just isn't. And that is a very practical point that I've tried to leave for you to consider in your life is what are you saying yes to? And I hope I was stirring something in you for you to even ask this question of yourself. What is possible in my life? In my family's future? What is possible when Christ is the head? And how do I make the choice to make him the head? And I only have one piece of advice to you. Yield. It's all there is. It's the hardest thing you'll ever find to do. But it's the simplest thing for you to understand what the choice you have before you. To acknowledge Christ as the head is to give him prerogative which is what he says goes, not what you think. And yielding your choice to his has profound ramifications both now and into the future. He sees what you do not. He knows and is very willing to share what he knows if you ask. Give him the prerogative. That is my encouragement. So we're going to end with this, which is just, I don't expect for you to make any choices in this moment. I really don't. But I hope what I've been able to accomplish for you is a framework for you to wrestle it out, because that's what it's going to look like. And Clayton, in the first week he started in Colossians, it was how to pray. He just had specific points to pray for your family and your children. But I'm praying this for you now. And it's from Colossians 1, verse 9, as it comes up. For this reason, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will. In all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. I would just like to pray a very simple prayer for you just out of that. So if you would, would you just stand? Lord, I thank you. I thank you. You are a king, but you are the most gracious king. 
that gave of yourself in its entirety for us. And my prayer for every single person here and represented is that they will be filled with the knowledge of your will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Lord, I ask that in the name of Jesus. Help them, Lord, in that understanding. And I bless them in their thinking. Would you help them? Because you, O oh Lord, are good. Amen. Amen.